Just two more examples of improper integrals, although these examples are a bit long-winded. Um, these are sort of, uh, I'll call them uh, sneakier improper integrals. They are sneakier uh, improper integrals, you know, from last time they were integrals that go out to infinity. And you have to turn it into a limit of something as uh, we use t, as t goes to infinity. Um, today I want to talk about some which I will call sneakier improper integrals. These are integrals which also must be converted into some kind of limit. But... At first glance, it's not obvious that you have to do it at all. So here is an example. It doesn't have infinities on it. That's why it's uh, a little sneaky. This one does involve some kind of infinite sized uh, area, but it's not obvious just by looking at it. And if you're not careful, you might just do the integral without without thinking about it as an improper, and you'll get the wrong answer. So this example, um, if you, uh, so I'm going to write, what I'm about to write is not correct. You can write this down if you want, but it's, uh, it's wrong, and I'll explain why this is wrong. From a naive point of view, the way you would do this is you would take the antiderivative, which is log of absolute value x, and plug in 3 and 1. You get natural log of 3 minus natural log of absolute value negative 1. This is ln of 3, which is just some number you do on your calculator if you want. And then this is ln of 1. ln of 1 is 0. And so my final answer is, is just ln of 3, which is, um, I plug that into my calculator. This is about uh, 1.09, etc. All right? So, yeah, this is wrong, though. Um, it looks fine. Like, it seems like everything is working just fine in this, uh, in this example. This is wrong, though. Why is it wrong? Well, think about the um, what this. Uh, think about what this. So just just to be sh just to be clear, all of that is wrong. Um, what the uh, what the integral represents is some kind of area, right? Of this function one over x. Everybody knows one over x looks like this. And I am going from minus one up to three. And now you can see the problem. It's from here up to here, and you can see there are actually parts of this which stretch out forever, only they're not in the horizontal direction, they're stretching out forever in the vertical direction. The issue here is the integral is going through a vertical asymptote, and now that doesn't necessarily mean that the area is infinite, as we saw last time. Sometimes the areas can stretch out forever but still be finite. So, um, but it's definitely definitely true that this area, whatever it is, is bigger than 1.09. Like I can see, for example, um, this right here is a unit square inside that area, and here's another unit square inside that area. So th the area is definitely not 1.09. In fact, the area might be infinity. In any case, it's much bigger than 1.09, all right? So these are sneakier improper integrals. The moral of the story is if we are integrating through a vertical asymptote, then we got problems. Really, it's, I mean, not just through, uh, the fact that it's an asymptote is not necessarily the, the only weird thing that can happen. Really, it's about integrating through discontinuities, right? This function, the original function, 1 over x, is not continuous at 0. And so when you're doing the integral, where the uh, integral range goes through 0, you should be worried. doesn't necessarily mean that the integral does not exist. This means you got to be careful about it. Yeah? That's right. This is going to be the strategy. So when we are integrating, uh, let me just say, if we are integrating through discontinuities, it is improper. I don't mean it's like morally wrong. I just mean that, that also counts as an improper integral, what we call an improper integral. So if we're integrating through discontinuities, it is improper, and you must do it in terms of limits.
as we approach the discontinuity points. Now, if the discontinuity is on just already on the end of one or the other ends of the integral, you can just turn it into a single limit. But in general, if the discontinuity is in the middle, like in this example, we have to break it into two separate integrals, the one on the left and the one on the right. And each one has one of their endpoints replaced by a limit. So um, we, I said we must do it in terms of limits as we approach the discontinuities. And I'm going to say often we need to break the integral into two pieces. Or I, I suppose in, in very bad cases, you would have to break it into many pieces if you had several discontinuities on the inside. If you're lucky, the discontinuity will already be on the end, and then you don't have to break it up. But anyway, um, in this example, what we have to do is this is equal to integral from minus 1 up to 0 plus the integral from 0 to 3. And we have to do each of those separately. And the way we're going to do them is by turning the 0 into a limit, because the 0 is not actually part of the domain. That's a discontinuity of that function. So the first one I'm going to write as lim t goes to 0 minus 1 to t, 1 over x dx. That first one was improper because 0 is not actually part of the domain of the function. And then plus, separately, another one. Lim t goes to 0, integral t to 3, 1 over x dx. Each time I'm turning the 0 into a variable, which is going to approach the 0 uh, in the limit. All right. Uh, and really, if you want to be super technical about this, really the first limit is t approaching 0 from the left side. Can I just say, I'll put this in parentheses, because in this example it doesn't matter, and usually it doesn't matter, uh, because the, the functions typically will have the same limit on, on either side. But And then this one would be t is approaching 0 from the right side. All right. Anyway, we got to do each of those two separately. So let's do them separately. So the first one, we're going to do each of those limits, or uh, each of those, well, yeah, each of those limits, which are integrals, and then add the two answers together. All right. So ignoring the limit for now, we're going to do the whole antiderivative and everything, keeping the t as a variable. And then at the very end, we take the limit as t goes to 0. So the antiderivative, the, the sort of wrong work that I did at the beginning was not wrong about the antiderivative. It is true that the antiderivative of 1 over x is ln absolute value x. And then I'm going to plug in minus 1 and t. So I get lim t goes to 0 ln absolute value t minus ln absolute value negative 1. That second part there, ln absolute value negative 1, that really is 0, because the natural log of 1 is 0. What about the limit part? This goes to 0, right? What about the other part? The limit as t goes to 0 of natural log absolute value t. You have to think about what is the graph of the natural log of the absolute value t look like, and what is what does the value do? This is what ln t looks like. If you do ln absolute value t, it just gives you both sides of it. So what do you say? The limit as t goes to 0 of that? Yeah, it looks like negative infinity on the graph. As t approaches 0 here, you're talking about values way down here. All right. Any, in any case, that we say diverges, right? There is no uh, specific number that that approaches. So this here, this diverges to minus infinity, all right? So the first half of this integral diverges. That means automatically the whole thing diverges, right? What we have here, remember our, our intention was to do each of these separately and then add the two answers together. 
But as soon as you know that one of them goes to infinity or minus infinity or whatever, that, that automatically means that the whole thing diverges. So, uh, so I'm going to say, so the integral uh, zero, sorry, minus 1 to 0 of 1 over x dx diverges. That was the one that we just computed. And so the whole thing, minus 1 to 3, 1 over x dx diverges. When you do break it up, if one or the other diverges, then you just say the whole thing diverges, and you don't even have to do the other one. Now, in this example, the other one also diverges. Actually, the other one diverges to plus infinity, but they don't add like add up to zero. You just say the whole thing diverges. All right. The integral diverges, yeah. Or you could say like the integral does not exist. There, there is no numerical answer. It's not a number. All right. Sure. Grab whatever you like. Um, okay, so I said we wanted, I wanted to do two examples. This was one of them. Let's try another one. Here's another one where it actually does exist. The, uh, the value of the integral really does exist. Let's try... Integral from 0 to 5 of 1 over cube root of x minus 2 dx. All right. Um, unfortunately, what all of this means is from now on, like for the rest of your life, every time you do the integral, you have to check first that it's actually continuous everywhere inside the integration values. And if it's not, you have to split it up and do improper integrals in the middle somewhere. And that, that's not obvious um, if that's necessary or not. You really have to look at the function and decide for yourself where are any discontinuities of that function. Now, the typical way you look for discontinuities is when the denominator equals 0, right? That's why 1 over x, the discontinuity is at 0. Um, so we should... Uh, ask ourselves, where are the discontinuities? If there's no discontinuity, then you just do the integral. Like then, then it's not an improper integral at all, so everything's fine. But um, in this case, is it possible for the denominator to equal zero? What do you think? Yeah, I think it is. For what value of x is the denominator zero? I see somebody doing the fingers. Yeah, for x equal 2, the denominator is 0, right? You want to just, you can tell just by looking at the denominator here. Sometimes you have to do a little work to figure this out, but in this case, this is discontinu discontinuous at x equal 2. That means we're going to have to break up the integral. One integral from 0 to 2. Would you mind just in preparation for doing the integral? I'm going to write it this way. x minus 2 to the negative 1 third. That's that's how you would think of that function in there. And then I have to add plus integral 2 to 5. Same thing. All right. And each of these we need to turn into a limit. So this is, well, I'm going to do them separately and add them together. So let's just start with the first one. It is, I'll write it as a limit this time. Lim as t goes to 2, integral 0 to t x minus 2 to the negative 1 third. All right. The 2 is the one I replace by t because the 2 is where the discontinuity is. Can we do this integral? And, you know, at this point, you might have to do, use some of your fancy integral tricks if, you, if, it's, if it's a weird function. This is a slightly weird function. Anybody uh, have an idea about how we could do the integral here? Don't even think about distributing the one-third power. It don't work that way. Reverse chain rule. Yeah? Do you, uh, do you mean the U substitution? Okay, 
Yeah, I think that sounds like the power rule. Yeah, Maybe the thing about, yeah. What about x minus 2 on the inside, though? Yeah, you can do a u substitution here. U substitution, of course, is based on uh, doing the chain rule backwards, which is what I thought is what you, <laughs> what you meant by reverse chain rule. You could call the u substitution. Uh, anyway, this is the way to do it. The, uh, you choose the inside of the parentheses, as usual, to be the u. And then the du, this is a fairly simple u substitution because the du is just equal to 1 dx, right? So you don't have to do any real fancy business here. It's just going to be integral, and then I have, it's just u to the minus 1 third du, right? No extra constants or anything like that. And so now we can do the integral. You increase the power by 1. It becomes u to the um, 2 thirds, right? Negative 1 third plus 1 is 2 thirds. And then we, uh, in front, multiply by 3 halves, or divide by 2 thirds, however you want to think of it. 1 over 2 thirds is 3 halves. And then I'm going to replace the x values, and then we'll plug the values in. So it's lim, t goes to 2, 3 halves, and then instead of u, I write x minus 2 to the 2 thirds, and I plug in the values for x are t and 0. All right. And plug them in. All right. I get, sorry, it's still lim t goes to 2, 3 halves, t minus 2 to the 2 thirds, minus 3 halves, 0 minus 2 to the 2 thirds. And now from there, we got to take the limit. Now the limit, uh, if you're lucky, you can just plug the value in, and that is the limit. And actually, in this case, it works just fine. If you plug in t equals 2, you actually get some number, and that, that is the answer. So when I just plug in the value for the limit, I get 3 halves, 0 minus 2, what? No, 2 minus 2, which is 0. That's why I had 0 on my mind. And then this other part, minus 3 halves, negative 2 to the 2 thirds. That means um, negative 2 squared to the third, which is the same as... I guess 4 to the third, right? You could write it that way if you want. Or you could write the negative 2 to the 2 thirds is the same as 2 to the 2 thirds. All right, and this thing on the front is 0, right? So my final answer for this part is negative 3 halves times, I'll write it as 4 to the 1 third. All right, so the area on the left side of the discontinuity is that. Doing okay so far? All right, now we're going to do the other side. Uh, we're going to have to do this same thing again, basically, but for the other half of the integral. Now, we, can, uh, we don't have to repeat all of these steps because most of them are going to be the same. Uh, but anyway, the second one will be this time lim x goes, uh, t goes to 2. And now it's going to be t up to, what did I say? Five? Five. Of x minus two to the one third dx. All right. Then we gotta do this integral now. Now this one, it's actually the same function in there. We're gonna use the same u substitution. And I don't think we need to write down all the details. Would you mind if we just jump to, look at this u substitution from here. I think I can just jump all the way down to here. And the only difference will be, instead of 0 and t, it's going to be t and 5, right? So this, I'm going to say equals same u substitution. And if you're doing this on a test or something, I would expect you not to go through the details again, although I suppose you can if you want to, but I would expect you to notice that it's, it's the same function in there. The only difference is the... Um, endpoint values, all right? So I skipped over the whole u substitution, which is exactly the same. The only difference is the, uh, the values on the endpoint. So we can just sort of jump down to this step. 
All right, and now we plug them in and take the limit, just like before. So it's going to be lim t goes to 2. Okay, plug in the 5. 3 halves, 5 minus 2 to the 2 thirds, minus, plug in the t. 3 halves, t minus 2 to the 2 thirds. And then we take the limit by plugging in t equals 2. We get 3 halves times 3 to the 2 thirds. That's 9 to the 1 third, if you like. And then minus 3 halves times 2 minus 2 to the 2 thirds. That's, whoa, sorry. That's 0. And so my answer for this part is just this. All right. And we're pretty much done. We just have to add the two answers together, right? We got, we had the two parts. We did the first one. We did the second one. And my final answer is the sum of those two things. So the final answer is the integral 0 to 5. This, whatever we started with, 1 over cube root of x minus 2 dx. It equals, the first part was negative 3 halves times 4 to the 1 third plus the second part. 3 halves times 9 to the 1 third. There you go. That number is the area for that one. Nine to the one third. Nine to the one third is the cube root of nine, which is not a nice number. The square root of nine is three, but the cube root of nine is something else. It's the irrational number. All right, that's how we do it. This is um, improper integrals. So. The sneaky ones, right? Sometimes it is not obvious that you have to treat it like an improper integral. Um, but you do. Any thoughts about that? This is how we do them. All right. It means, unfortunately, say on our next test or something, every time you see an integral, you have to, like, in the back of your mind, be suspicious that it might be an improper integral. Even if you don't see an infinity in one of the integration boundaries, you still have to check that it is proper. Um, or else you'll have to do a lot more work if it turns out to be improper. All right. I think that's all I want to say about improper integrals. And thus, that's pretty much all we're going to say about integrals. I hope you're satisfied with integrals. Any, uh, any last questions or comments about these? Excellent. Now, if you take our uh, Calc 3 class, you will learn... A bunch more about integrals in different contexts, but this will do it for for us for now. I'm satisfied with that. All right, excellent. Thank you for coming along this integration journey with me. Um, we're going to go on to something completely different, which is uh, sequences and series. And this is what we're going to talk about for the rest of the semester. We're a little a little bit past the halfway mark uh, for the semester. Sequences and series. Uh, this is likely something that you haven't talked about before, at least not in the same detail as derivatives and integrals. Sequences and series. So, um, let's just talk about them. So, a sequence, uh, these two words are equal are, are easy to confuse with one another, but they don't mean the same thing. A sequence is just an infinite list of numbers. All right, so for example, here's a sequence, two, four, six, eight, etc. right? A sequence is always infinitely long, uh, so it you know, a typical sequence will have this, this little dot, dot, dot at the end where usually we write enough terms of the sequence so that you can tell what the pattern is and then you put the dot, dot, dot. Or here's another one. One, two, four, eight, sixteen. Anybody recognize that? These are the, uh, these are the powers of two, right? That's a sequence, all right? Uh, there are sort of stupider sequences. One, two, three, four, five, etc. This is just a sequence of 
natural numbers, that's what those are called, just the positive uh, whole numbers, or something like, here's a especially stupid one, this is a constant sequence, right? All zeros. Or here's another stupid one. 8675309867, etc. Everybody knows the classic sequence. Um, that last one is just to demonstrate that, you know, not all sequences have a nice formula to them. Uh, sometimes they're just, I mean, anything counts as a sequence of numbers. These are all whole numbers that I wrote, but we're going to talk about, they don't have to be whole numbers in a sequence. They could be anything. All right. Usually, the sequences we talk about, have they do have some kind of pattern or formula to them. Usually, when we talk about sequences, there's a formula to them. I mean, usually in this class, not really usually. In the, in the real world, sequences tend to just, they do whatever they want. But in this class, at least, usually there's a formula for these. And the way that we would typically write the formulas is something like a n equals, in this case, 2 times n. That is a formula which describes the terms of that sequence. So a1 would be the first one, which is, would be 2 times 1, which is 2. A2 is the second one, which would be 2 times 2, which is 4. A3 is uh, 2 times 3, which is 6, right? Generally, uh, when we write a sequence, we call them A1, A2, A3. So this is A1, A2, A3. And the value of An in this example is just 2 times N. All right. Uh, how about the next one? What would you say the... Um, the formula for this sequence is these are the powers of 2. So this is really 2 to the power n. Now, in this case, um, in this example, a starts at 1. If I write this formula, it's more convenient in this one to write, sorry, not a, n. The n starts at 1. Right, the first term is a1. Whereas in this uh, second one there, it's more convenient to write the formula starting at zero. Here, n starts at zero, right? Because the first one there, the number one, that would be two to the zero. Now, if you wanted to write the formula, if they started n equals one, then the formula would be a n equals two to the power n minus one, which is kind of a pain. You can do it, but it's a pain. Uh, what about this one? Uh, a n equals... Anyone want to give me a formula for this one? Yeah, n, or n plus 1, if you want to start. It depends if you start at 1 or 0. And, you, you know, we'll sort of, when convenient, we'll start at 1. When convenient, we'll start at 0. Um, I would say n, or you could say n plus 1, if you, uh, if you want to start at 0. Uh, how about this one? Can you give me a formula for the terms for that one? N times zero would work. Did you say zero to the first? Zero to the power one? I guess that would work. How about zero? Right? That's probably the easiest way to write that. I mean, you could... Uh, you don't have to use an n over there, right? Just like in a, a constant function, you know, function of x doesn't have to use the x if it's going to be a constant. A sequence is the same way. And then that last one doesn't really have a formula, although you could probably invent a, a weird formula that, that obeys, uh, you know, that those numbers obey, but it, there's no formula for, for that one, really. All right. So... This is just very basic terminology here. So, for example, for this sequence, usually a sequence will be described by the formula sort of from the get-go, all right? If this is the description of the sequence, the individual numbers are called the terms. I've already been using that word, but I might as well say it specifically. The terms are, you know, A1 is 3 plus 5, which is 8. 
A2 is 3 plus 5 times 2, which is 13. A3 is 3 times 3 plus 5 times 3, which is 18, etc. Each of those numbers are called the terms of the sequence, the numbers in there. All right? And usually in the sequences that we talk about in our book, I'm going to say by default, the uh, n starts at 1. But, like I said, sometimes it's more convenient to start the n at 0. And to clarify this point, these sequences are sometimes written like this. Inside these curly things. So this is the sequence whose terms look like 3 plus 5n. And to clarify this bit about are we going to start at 0 or 1, sometimes you'll see it written this way from n equals 1 to infinity. So that's similar to like how you would see the summation uh, notation written. So this one, the terms are 8, and then 13, and then 18, like I just said above. But if you wanted it to start at 0, then that might be written like this, 3 plus 5n, where n equals 0 to infinity. And then the terms for that one would be, the first one would be 3, and then 8, and then 13, and then 18. Right? So this is just notation for starting the sequence. Usually, like I said, by default, we're going to assume that the n starts at 1, but sometimes it's better or more convenient to start at 0. And I suppose you could start it somewhere else if you wanted to, but that, that is going to happen very rarely. So, for example, this sequence here, Minus 1 to the n times n. n equals 1 to infinity. This has terms inside a sequence. That little minus 1 to the n is something that we're going to see fairly often. Um, minus 1 to the n is a way of introducing an alternating sign, right? Because when n is odd, negative 1 to the n will be a minus sign. But when n is even, negative 1 to the n will be a plus sign. So the terms here are negative 1 followed by 2, followed by minus 3, followed by 4, minus 5, etc. You're getting n every time, but you are alternating the signs uh, in front of it. And so this is, these are the terms of that sequence. All right? And you could, you know, even if you, even without writing out all the terms, since you have that formula there, you could say, for instance, what is A, A175, the 175th term? You just use that formula as if it were a function, and you plug in 175. It would be minus 1 to the 175 times 175, which is, that would be negative 175. Because when the exponent there is, is uh, odd, you get a negative number. All right. Simple stuff. How about, I got two interesting sequences to discuss, at least briefly, that uh, I'm sure one of them you've probably seen before and probably the other one you haven't. Um, one sequence that's like everybody's favorite sequence, the Fibonacci sequence. The Fibonacci sequence. This is named after an um, Italian mathematician named... Anybody know? Named uh, Leonardo. <laughs> this is not the artist Leonardo. Uh, uh, the guy who we call Fibonacci was he during his lifetime. I, I recently read a book about Fibonacci, so um, this is why I have these facts at at my recall. Um, he was in his, in his no, own lifetime. He was known as Leonardo of Pisa. He was from Pisa, like where the Leaning Tower is. Um, but I guess there are lots of Leonardo's uh, in Pisa, I can imagine. And um, Fibonacci means like the son of Bonacci. His, his dad was named Bonacci, or maybe just Nacci, I don't know. Uh, but this, this Fib, or Fi, means the son. Anyway, um, 
Fibonacci did not actually, was not the inventor of this sequence. Fibonacci wrote a very influential book about, this is, is like in the, in the uh, 1200s. He wrote a, an, a very influential book, which is, Fibonacci, like, as a mathematician, didn't really do much on his own, but um, in terms of the history of mathematics, I, I would say Fibonacci is one of the most important figures in European mathematics because he was the first um, mainstream European academic to bring the Arabic number system to Europe, which was a huge deal. Uh, b before Fibonacci's times, people in Europe were generally using Roman numerals, which is fine if you just want to write down numbers, but if you want to do mathematics, Roman numerals are absolutely terrible. I don't know if you've ever thought about uh, if you wanted to, for instance, add together the numbers like 27 plus uh, 41. In Arabic numbers, you do this, right? 68. You don't even have to carry, all right? This was not known to the people of Europe at the time of Leonardo of Pisa. Um, and uh, Fibonacci was the son of a, of a, of a rich, like, shipping merchant, and he lived in, uh, in Italy, but Fibonacci spent time in northern Africa, like buying and selling stuff that he would bring back to, uh, to Europe. And he saw the merchants in, in Africa using the Arabic numbers, and he was sort of mystified that they were able to do calculations like this, which to a European, they would have thought this calculation is not possible to do without using an abacus or, or some kind of mechanical device to, uh, to help with. Because in, in Roman numerals, this looks like XXVII plus that, isn't that, is that? I think that's how you would do 40, 41 yeah. in Roman numerals. But you, I mean, the, the Romans would never have tried to do this and add them because that doesn't, it's not helpful to write these numbers in columns and add them together. Like there isn't, uh, it just doesn't work, right? You, you, uh, it don't work that way in Roman numerals. And if you think of say, trying to multiply or, or do like long division is just straight up impossible with Roman numerals. Um, the people of Europe at this time were like a bunch of, um, a bunch of rich kids today who learn how to use their calculators but don't actually know how to multiply numbers together. Um, they think you have to use your calculator for everything. Uh, whereas the, the Africans were like, hey, you guys, you don't have to use calculators for that. You can just, um, you just do it by hand. Uh, anyway, this is Fibonacci's great uh, contribution to Europe, European mathematics. It was not something that he invented. He, he just saw other people doing this and he was like, oh, okay. This is important. So he wrote this book about using the Arabic numbers. By the way, actually, this, this right here, um, n like I said, people have not known how to do this uh, for all of human history, of course. Um, in fact, this was invented around the 800s AD, fairly recent. Like, even Jesus didn't know how to do that. Um, and uh, if you think about the, the history of mathematics, it's, it's kind of obvious that Jesus didn't know how to do that. But anyway, this, uh, in fact, we know the name of the person who invented this. Anybody know the name of the person? Actually, it's not, it's not clear that this person actually invented this, but this is an Arabic mathematician named Al-Khwarizmi. Um, wrote the first book which describes this process. So either he invented it or he, he knew a guy who knew a guy, right? Um, but... Uh, Al Khwarizmi is like this guy is by any measure one of the all-time greats, all-time OGs of mathematics and science, um, which uh, white people don't talk about this guy very much, but um, we should. I mean, he's definitely in the same category as Pythagoras or um, uh, you know Isaac Newton or something, although quite a bit before uh, Newton. Newton. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the apple. Yeah, Al Khwarizmi. Uh, also, um, this was, I mean, in my opinion, his great contribution was like this way of adding numbers, which is so awesome that you don't even, 
think of it as a thing that somebody had to invent. Like, I don't know about you, but the way I sort of feel about this procedure is just like, yeah, that's just how you do it. Not, not that somebody invented this, but just like, this is somehow like built into the fabric of the universe. Uh, but it's, it's not. Actually, somebody did invent that. Um, it was al Khwarizmi. In the great school of uh, Baghdad was where all the math and science in the world was, was really happening at that point. Um, there was also in India and China, but definitely not in Europe. Um, al Khwarizmi also invented the sextant, which is pretty awesome as, as a... Um, I mean, nowadays we think of it as a as a uh, sort of marine navigation device, but actually they were using it in in the middle of Asia as a navigation device. It works fine on land too, but that's the thing that looks like um, looks kind of like a protractor that has like a little telescope attached to it, and you sort of you point something at the sun and you point something else at the horizon, and it tells you. Um, tells you precisely the position of the sun, and you can use it to locate the precise position of stars also, which basically can tell you your latitude on the Earth where you are, which is kind of a big deal. Um, al Khwarizmi also knew that the um, you knew that the Earth was round and calculated the radius of the Earth to pretty good. Uh, I mean, it wasn't wasn't precise the way that we know, but very accurate. Um, for his time. Okay, anyway. Yeah, you can do it by measuring. This was done by the Greeks also. Um, but I think al Khwarizmi had the... I think the Greeks did it before him, but he, he improved the uh, estimations that, that were in use. But you can do it by... Um, I think like during the time of Alexander the Great, it was noticed because they were they had these like you know Alexander's empire was was big right there was like up here in Europe and then down here in Africa it's like the Mediterranean Sea over here there were like um, I've heard of this experiment being done in the very old days with like Egyptian obelisks and they knew that on certain dates. Um, even at noon, so the equator is like here or something, right? I don't really know. The equator goes through northern Africa, right? I think, yeah. So um, at noon exactly on a certain day of the year, if the obelisk is on the equator, it will cast no shadow at all, right? But it was also noticed that similar tall structures in southern Europe, even on the on at noon exactly they did cast a shadow sort of directly north that's because the sun is passing over directly above the equator the sun is never directly above this this thing up here right um, the reason is because these two things are actually sort of sticking out the sides of the earth like this and they can compute by using sort of ground navigation. They can compute this distance here, or estimate it at least. Um, and then, if you use the um, using the the length of this shadow here, you can you can determine this angle, which then allows you to determine the radius of the Earth by using some trigonometry. Hmm? Yeah, some yeah, some Pythagorean theorem kind of thing. So uh, you have to compensate for the fact that this this is curved, not straight. But um, yeah, so I don't know how Al Khwarizmi did it. This is this something like this was done by like I, I don't I don't remember who, but yeah, some fancy fancy business they did, which was all like. The idiot Europeans of later years had no knowledge of this. They, um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, in our remaining five minutes, can I just say some? So, uh, all of this I, I got sidetracked from uh, talking about the Fibonacci sequence, which, like I said, Fibonacci himself did not um, invent this. 
but he included it in an example in his book. So he wrote this book uh, called Liber Abaki, which means, you could say it means, uh, like this Liber means book, and this means, um, I mean, it means uh, abacus, but it also, like the word, we say abacus for that, that, that thing with the beads on it, but it really means some, something like counting. Um, so it's sort of a book about counting or a book about numbers or something. This was the name of Fibonacci's book. And this was included as an example in his book. Um, early, I looked this up. The history of this sequence has been talked about by other people before Fibonacci. And uh, he probably got it from some Arabic uh, text or something. It was first uh, discussed by a math uh, an Indian guy. I don't know how to pronounce this, but Pingala. Uh, in around 300 B.C. Um, was somebody talking about the Fibonacci sequence. But anyway, what's interesting for our purposes, I'll call this, let's call it Fn. Fn doesn't have a very nice formula. Uh, I hope you've all seen this before. The way you get each number is by adding the two previous numbers. So the simplest way to write a formula for this is uh, you just say F1 equals 1 and F2 equals 1. This is how you get it started. And then all of the subsequent terms obey this formula, fn equals fn minus 1 plus fn minus 2. So after the first two, the way you get each next one is by adding the two previous ones. All right, this right here, this is called um, a recursive formula. Recursive means the definition, like, we have an equal sign there, so we are saying what Fn is. But it's um, the definition of Fn depends on the other values of this sequence, right? I'm not telling you just a formula in terms of n, but I'm telling you a formula in terms of the other values of the same sequence. This is called a recursive formula. And recursive formulas are kind of hard to use because, for instance, if I ask you, like, what is F100, the 100th Fibonacci number? The answer is, I don't really know. I mean, you have to, you have to really, you would have to just start here and compute them all out to get to the hundredth one. And using this, this formula is not helpful to find values of the sequence that are like deep down in the sequence. All right. So I'm just going to say this is hard to say. Yeah, sure. Well, yes, but the calculator also would have to just start at the beginning and compute them all. Um, this formula, you know, the calculator can do that much faster. But if I said instead of F100, I could say F of, you know, 100 billion, then the calculator would, would take a while. But I'm here to say, i got two minutes. This is enough time. Here's a fun fact about the Fibonacci sequence. You can tell your friends. There actually is a non-recursive formula that is a formula that you can just plug the n into and get, say, f100 um, without computing any of the other values. A non-recursive formula. Check it out. This is I was. This is kind of mind blowing, in my opinion. Um, you are immediately going to see something in the formula which you don't expect. At least I would never expect. One over square root of five times. 1 plus root 5 over 2 to the n minus 1 minus root 5 over 2 to the n. What did you not expect to see in the formula? I would say you did not expect to see the square root of 5 in such a formula. At least you should not have. The Fibonacci numbers are all whole numbers, right? It is, it is some kind of a magical fact that when you take this formula and plug a whole number in for n, all these root fives will cancel, and you end up with just a whole number as the answer. Very strange. Um, this has a name. This is called Binet's formula. It's named after a French guy um, who also did not discover this formula. This, so I think somebody else did, but this is a, a common thing in math and science. Things are named after the wrong person. Uh, this, 
Another fun fact, that number right there, this is the golden ratio, which you may have heard of. There is a connection between the Fibonacci numbers and the, the golden ratio. All right. Fun times, the Fibonacci sequence. It, uh, they say it comes up a lot in nature. This is actually somewhat overblown. It does come up sometimes in nature, but it's not, not as much as people like to say it does. All right, I think that'll do for now. We'll talk much more about sequences next time, and we'll also do the quiz next time. All right, see you later. Do the homework.